Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends, Welcome to the Unknown Bible, the broadcast ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. Join us now for today's Bible study with our pastor, Bevan's Welder. Today we are going to talk about a specific subject dealing with God and His relationship to sin and sinners. Is it true that God hates sin and yet loves sinners? Or does He hate the sinner too? This is an unpopular question, and it's unpopular because the answer containing biblical truth is not popular. You see, the question is a good one, and it's been asked by many Christians. And hopefully the answer you hear today should clarify who or what God hates. It's not meant to be an exhaustive answer. You'll find on your own similar references in the Bible that will establish the doctrine you hear today. You know, the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses is every word established. So let's go to the Bible and let's find out about God's love and God's hatred and see how it applies to this question. Does God hate the sin and love the sinner or does he hate the sinner too? Okay, well, on the one hand, we have John chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we have that verse. And what does it say? God so loved the world. And he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that gift was given to the world before someone trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So his, his love that was shown to the world was demonstrated to whosoever. But then you go to James chapter 4, and in James chapter 4 and verse 4, we find another verse, and watch what it says. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Well, on the one hand, he says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he's a recipient of the love that God showed to the world when he gave us his son. And James 4, 4 says, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So on the one hand, we see that God loved the world. And on the other hand, we see that God is an enemy of the world. So which is it? We're going to go through and we're going to carefully study some verses in the Bible and come to the conclusion, biblically, of what the answer is. God's love for the world was demonstrated at Calvary. Christ died for the ungodly. Look at Romans chapter 5. He didn't die for the godly. He died for the ungodly. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And then in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, here, here's God's love again. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And what is that a demonstration of? It's a demonstration of his love. God commendeth his love toward us. When? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we should be saved by his life. Notice, notice we were reconciled when? When we were enemies. 
God reconciled himself to us as enemies when Christ died on the cross. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We were in Romans chapter 5 just then. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verses 18 and 19. All things are of God. 2 Corinthians 5.18, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us, that is, those of us who are saved, the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You know what he's saying? He's saying that when Christ died on the cross, the world was reconciled to God. And then we, we, those of us who are saved, have a ministry of reconciliation to let the world know of this reconciliation. Now listen, this reconciliation doesn't mean that God loves his enemies presently in the condition they're in. Listen very carefully to this statement. It means that God is willing to extend them his love if they will accept the sacrifice of Jesus that reconcile them to God. Listen very carefully. The ministry of reconciliation means that God is willing to extend them his love, sinners, his love, if they will accept the sacrifice of Jesus that reconcile them to God. That's why John said in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. He made the first move. We love him because he first loved us. And that first move was made when Jesus Christ was given and, and, and died, was buried, and rose again the third day. Now, let me show you an example of this love during Jesus' ministry. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and look at verse 21. Mark chapter 10 and verse 21. This is very interesting. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus was approached by a rich man who was a young ruler. And this rich man wanted to know what he must do to inherit eternal life. Watch it. Mark 10, 17, when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Oh, that's what he's looking for. And Jesus told him, thou knowest the commandments. Verse 19, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Now watch verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. All right, the man's not saved yet. Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And you know what? That man was sad and went away, grieved, for he had great possessions. And you know what Jesus Christ did? Nothing. He looked round about, saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? The disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Now watch. Watch. Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Yet when the ruler refused to follow what Jesus commanded, sell all you have, give to the poor, to, you know, come follow me, then Jesus let him go and simply used this man as an example of how hard it is for men who trust their riches to get saved. So Jesus' love for this sinner is not the same as his love for the children of God. It's the same as his love in John 3, 16, that compassion that caused him to offer himself in sacrifice for this fellow. Go back to John chapter 3, 
where we read verse 16, God so loved the world, a and look at verses 17 and 18. John chapter 3, verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why he did it, to save us. To he, he reconciled us to himself so we could be saved. Now watch verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Here's the interesting truth. A sinner who doesn't believe on Jesus Christ is condemned, listen, already. Already. That is, he doesn't have to wait until he's dead. He doesn't have to wait until he's judged to be under the condemnation of God. He's under it right now. And notice, it is not the sin that is under the condemnation. It is the sinner. He that believeth not, or believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Whew. Look at John chapter 3, verse 36. You'll see another example. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, present possession. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Whoa! The wrath of God abides on a sinner who does not believe on Jesus Christ. He's not waiting to, to be exposed to the wrath of God at the end of his life. The wrath of God is on him right now. So it's inconceivable that God's wrath could abide on him at the same time God is loving him. A lost sinner who, who believes God loves him and refuses to believe that the wrath of God abides on him, you know what? He generally won't get saved. Listen very carefully to what I just said. When a sinner is lost, if he believes God loves him, I mean, in the same way that God loves us, you know, it, 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 God is love and he loves everybody. If he believes, if he believes God loves him and refuses to believe that the wrath of God abides on him, like John 336 says, you know what? He won't get saved. Very rarely do they get saved like that. What's the problem? Because they believe that they're already in the in the love of God, there's no reason to get saved. Consider what happened in Nineveh, back in Jonah. When, when Jonah preached, God was ready to wipe out the city in 40 days. It, it wasn't a trick. It, it was the truth. When, when Jonah came into Nineveh and began to preach, he said, in Jonah 3, 4, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. An unqualified statement. However, because the king in jo Jonah chapter 3 and all the people repented, God changed his mind and extended them mercy and spared them. You know what caused him to do that? His long suffering. It wasn't his love. That caused him to send Jonah and give them one more chance. It was God's wrath that would have caused him to kill more than 120,000 innocent children. Those who could not discern between their right hand and their left hand. Look at Jonah chapter 4 at verse 11. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand, that's 120,000 persons, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. <laughs> God's love was not, was not apparent to them until they repented. His forbearance was, his long-suffering was, when they repented, then God, because of his love, spared them. But it, it wasn't his, you understand, it wasn't his, uh, that what, what, what he has for them like he does for us after we get saved is not the same as what he has for them beforehand. 
You see, you and I have the ministry of reconciliation that was mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. That's what we have. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, which we didn't read before, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. What does that mean? We're ambassadors for Christ. We are to tell sinners who are enemies of God that they don't have to perish in the wrath of God that abides on them. They can receive Jesus Christ and be saved like you and I are. They can receive Jesus Christ and be loved. Thus, like Jesus Christ had compassion, had love for that rich young ruler, we must have compassion on sinners and be willing to tell them the truth about their current state. And we must tell them the truth about God's love. You know, it's a strange, I realize, I realize, we're going to look at some more verses, and I've just got to pause here. I realize that it seems like somewhat of a paradox. It's not a paradox at all when you read and believe what God said. Listen, God finds sin abominable. We're going to see this. And, and, and his wrath abides on those who do not have Jesus Christ, who have not received him. And to say that God loves sinners in that condition is to say, you're all right. You don't need to change. Everything's fine. And that's not so. The truth is, sinners without Christ are under the wrath of God. It abides on them now. They're under condemnation. We must tell them the truth about that. And we must tell them the truth about God's love. And what it is to us who now are saved and have received Jesus Christ. Listen, when God had it with Israel, you know Israel is God's chosen people, right? When God had it with Israel, before he drove them completely out of his house, you know what he said in Hosea chapter 9 and verse 15? <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. this. This is telling us a great deal about God. Israel, the, the, the nation he promised not to forsake, Israel, who's pictured by the burning bush, a, a nation that will never be consumed. Uh, uh, Israel, God's chosen people. Look at it. Hosea chapter 9 and verse 15. This is really, really eye-opening. All their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings will I drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Now that, listen to that. You see what you read there? I hated them and I will love them no more. Now, of course, at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will save them. He will take them back. In Romans chapter 11, Verses 25 through 27, before you, you know, jump off and say, hey, 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 that means he's done with them. No, he's not done with them. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. So he's going to do that. But look what he said in Hosea. He hated them. Look what he did to them for crucifying his son and resisting the gospel. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, we're reading in the New Testament. And look what the Bible says concerning them and concerning the wrath of God. This is amazing. 1, Samuel cha uh, 1 Th uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. You, brethren, for you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Watch it. To fill up their sins alway, here it is, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Wow. 
Wow. Wrath is come upon them, not the sin, the sinners, to the uttermost. That's not God loving the sinner and hating the sin. You see, we have, we have to know what the Bible will show us about the nature of God. And I'll tell you, he's not like us. In Malachi chapter 1 verse 3, look what he says. Malachi chapter 1 verse 3, I hated Esau. Verse 2, he said, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. He says the same thing in Romans 9, 13. Turn to Psalm 11 and look at verse 5. You know, we read the Psalms for comfort and there's so many wonderful things in there. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of prophecy and there's a lot of doctrinal truth in here. Pro uh, Psalm chapter 11, look at verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Did you read the same passage of scripture that I just read? He doesn't say that he hates their sin. He said he hates them. The wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Now, before you uh, misunderstand what I just said about him hating them and not saying that he hated their sin. He also hates their sin. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verses 16 through 19, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So he definitely hates the sin. But shockingly, if you didn't already know it, he hates the sinner. <clears throat> he hates those that work iniquity. <sighs> you know, that's not the same thing as saying he hates the works, but loves the workers. He didn't say, I love the workers of iniquity, but I hate their sin. God certainly hates wickedness. Turn to Psalm 45 and verse 7. He hates wickedness. Thou lovest righteousness, Psalm 45, 7, and hatest wickedness. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. He hates wickedness. But listen, he also hates the ones who do the wickedness. Uh, consider, consider these verses. Okay, listen to what he says. Hebrews 13, 4, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Uh. Ephesians 5, verses 5 through 7, no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater. Do you see? He's not talking about the sin. He's talking about the sinner, whoremonger, unclean person, covetous man who is an idolater. And then he goes on to say, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. It's the people. It's the people. It is not just the sin. Jesus died for the sins and he died for the sinners. But when sinners don't receive Jesus Christ as their savior, they're under condemnation, and the wrath of God abides on them. Psalm 5.5, 5, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Wow. You see it? It's the people. In Revelation 21.8, It's the sinners, not their sins that have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look at it. Revelation 21, 8. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars. It's the people. It's the people. It's not palatable to sinners to hear this answer to the question whether God hates the sin or the sinner. <laughs> because, listen, the sinners want to be able to say, you know, I know that God doesn't like it when I do such and such, but he loves me. This answer, listen, 
to the question, does God hate the sin and love the sinner? This answer is not even palatable to many who call themselves Christians. They can't stand the thought that God would hate a sinner. But this answer is the truth. And you see it from the scripture. You know what I have found since entering the ministry? This is what I found. Sinners who realize the truth of God's wrath abiding on them and who also realize the depth of God's love for the world demonstrated in the gift of Jesus Christ, you know what? They generally get saved. That's right. When, when they realize they're all, that the wrath of God is abiding on them, but there has been a love of God demonstrated in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, those two things will bring them to Christ. And, and then when they get saved, they appreciate the love of God for them as his children, much more than people who don't know the whole truth. When I find sinners who, who get saved, but they didn't realize the wrath of God was on them so much, and they thought God loved them, just loved them a little better after they got saved. They don't have as much appreciation for the love of God. I'm reminded of that woman who anointed the feet of Jesus Christ with oil, with a, and then and then wiped her, and and her tears, and then wiped that with her hair. Oh, she loved much. She loved much because she was forgiven much, and it made a tremendous amount of difference in her relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will make a tremendous amount of difference in your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ to recognize the love that he has for you as his child. Okay? The love that he demonstrated for you and to you when he allowed his own son to be sacrificed for your sins. And the wrath that was on you till you got saved. Oh, that change, I'm telling you, that changed your life. And it will also change the way that sinners... Hear the message of the gospel when you preach it. There's a real fear of God in understanding God's hatred for sin and sinners. And I pray that you're brave enough to tell them. Amen. You have been listening to The Unknown Bible, the radio ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. For information about our church, go to our church website at www.my3bc.com. That's my, the number three, bc.com. If you would like to contact us by telephone, our number is 361-241-6100. Bible Believers Baptist Church is a Bible-believing church located at 1701 Rand Morgan Road. If you are not currently a member of a Bible-believing church and you are looking for a church with an uncompromising stand on the words of God, come visit with us this Sunday or Wednesday. We would love to see you. Hallelujah.